I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. We're on number five in our series of toxic masculinity, our accidental series on toxic masculinity. It keeps masculinity. getting more accidental the longer we, we do it. It could end up being like 27 accidental podcasts in a row. <laughs> this, there's, there's a lot of issues with masculinity in Chinese literature. It's, I mean, the, the phrase that we have not yet used in this series of podcasts is zhong nan qing nu, which is uh, emphasize or promote the male uh, uh, de-emphasize the female, something like that. It's a, a phrase that's often used to discuss uh, the importance of men in Chinese society and the lack of importance of women. Right. Not that China's really any different from any other uh, pre-contemporary society and that. I mean, you can see that in, in, in a lot of... I mean, even in the contemporary West, you can see it some, though I would argue probably less than in pre-modern China. But you know, India, Africa, most places are 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 similar to China in this respect. Yeah. Certainly in pre-modern Europe. So we we've talked about a number of stories. Some of them sort of as outright expressions of this, almost advocating this. Uh, the story we talked about last time was Ren the filial son. Um, which doesn't necessarily, depending on how you read it, presents Confucianism as either an expression of this or as kind of an opponent to this. It's it's a it's a strange, we strange story with what it was. Yeah, we disagreed, as we so often do. Um, the story we're talking about today is "Sinking" by Yu Dafu, and the way I'm reading it, and Lee, you and I discussed this ahead of time. You're not necessarily seeing it this way, but. For me, one of the interesting questions going into the modern era, modern for me being just basically 20th century, just to be sort of blunt about it, how do you get out of this? A lot, not just in terms of toxic masculinity, but in terms of a lot of things. A lot of these early modern Chinese writers are asking the question, how do we get away from all of this stuff that once that we used to use, right? Because uh, we're in this position where multiple foreign powers have treaty ports uh, are occupying our soil are pushing us around how did we get to this point and how do we get out of it using literature i think this is a good place to segue directly into the the story which you already mentioned was judafu's uh, story sinking which is chunlun uh it's a very famous story it was uh, a kind of one hit wonder i would argue chun uh judafu is a writer who comes from Zhejiang. He studies, he goes to Japan in 1913 to study economics. While he's there, he hangs out with a bunch of Chinese students, Guomoro being one of them. And they found a society called the Creation Society, the Chuangzao Shi. And in that, he publishes this story, which is a very weird, like very psychologically oriented story. Which Freud is, would love the story. Would, he would have a play. Oh my goodness! It be, it, it's a Freudian playground. Absolutely, and uh, it's a story that's very much inside the narrator's head. And he is a student of, studying abroad in Japan, and th- I'm not making this up. This is just how the story goes. He he can't get it up. Because China is so weak. So the, the character in the story comes into contact with lots of Japanese women, uh, and he feels completely inadequate around them all the time, including courtesans and tea houses where you're supposed to just whatever, let's just do whatever. Uh, and he blames his his national heritage, basically, for his sexual dysfunction. In, in, in other words, because China cannot get it up geopolitically, he cannot get it up physically. Succinctly put, very, very uh, a sophisticated treatment of the story. And yeah, the funny thing is, that's a, more or less how it is. Now, Yudaf was a much better writer than a, than a lot of the others we have talked about so far. Um, a little bit more elegant, I would argue, than some of the other era, writers from his era, even. Um, but it's such a peculiar way to deal with the question of national, what perceived national failure, martial failure. Uh, the ability to protect one's borders and land, et cetera. How does this transform? And the reason I had suggested using it in this series is you see a lot of the same themes at play here. So in Shui Hu Zhuan in the Water Margin, you and I had talked about how the story is kind of an allegorical reading of the, what we used the, the official term, sissification of the Chinese male population uh, at the time. And so this is supposed to be the antidote, right? Let's go out and pump some muscles and wave those swords. Jinping Mei, 
uh, using governmental and economic power and indeed some sexual power as well uh, to achieve dominance, right? Uh, but what if you are none of the heroes in any of these stories, right? What if you are someone who is in this country and you're not Wu Song, you're not Xi Menqing, uh, you're not even Ren the Filial Son, you're mm -hmm. just a dude studying economics. You're, you're just a loser, right? You're just a loser, like literally just a loser. You're just hanging out. Of course, he's not actually a loser because if you've gotten a, a scholarship study in Japan, you're probably not a loser. Yeah, I mean, but, sure. He, but he, but that, I mean, that's part of the point, right? Because in, in, in the terms of the masculinity of these earlier stories, kind of is a loser, right? You sit in a room all day and read about money. Like, what's the point of that? Yeah. Uh, I just want to point something out. I find it fascinating the way this story makes explicit, almost explicit, the, the sort of reading of gender onto the structure of nations. You know, to be made, like, you can't be a guy if someone is penetrating your borders, that, that's fascinating in this kind of like gendered reading. I don't, I don't really know what to make of it. Frankly, I, Rob, I'm actually less convinced that this story is well written than you are. I think it's interesting comparatively. Yeah, I, th I think it's interesting in terms of the ideas that it's dealing with. I think this that that Yudafu is struggling to take these sorts of sexualized courtesan. Uh, works of fiction that he's read that are very much in the mind of every Chinese writer who is writing at this time, and the story is published in 1921. All the all of the folks who are educated, this is what they spent their free time reading. This kind of like guys going uh, and getting and, and hanging out with prostitutes. It's called the the genre in Chinese is uh, tai tzu jaren, and there have been some folks who have made the argument that you scholar beauty novels. Yeah, sorry. Taizu being scholar, Jaren being beauty, and like how scholars and 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 beauties kind of get it on, essentially, right? Like it's, I mean, that I'm reducing it a little, but not much. It's right. not, right. it's not. I mean, it's well written, but it's not like not very that entertaining. Well <laughs> um, it's not that interesting, I would say. Mm -hmm. But Yudafu is psychologically quite interesting because we're just in this guy's head, and he's thinking about what everybody is thinking about him, and he's trying to reconcile that with the geopolitical status of China. And that's what I find fascinating about this short story, not the writing. To clarify, I'm not putting Yudafu in the same league as people who wrote something like Jin Ping Mei or, or the, 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 the Hong Lomong, The Dream of Red Chambers. Um, but there's a lot of people in that era who were trying to sort of renovate or save Chinese literature who frankly were not very good. Revolutionary maybe, but not very good. Uh, I find him a better writer than a lot of them, not okay. compared to the true greats. But anyway, but you're right. The, it's the, really the ideas here that are more interesting than the way they're executed. Um, Hang on, I have a thought. He's writing at the same time that Lu Xun is publishing a lot of his work. And although I have been on, I'm on the record as being critical of Lu Xun, I think that Lu Xun is a great writer, yep. hands down. Yudafu, yeah. yeah, jury's out on that one. Uh, but what you were saying about the scholar beauty novels is interesting, though, because even those can be read in the light of what we've been talking about in this series so far, because the other works we've talked about, for the most part, are examples of how men with the right muscles and the right code of honor can pretty much just subjugate everything and make it all work for them, right? Well, what happens if you just don't have a lot of muscles, and in fact, mostly what you're good at is, say, adding numbers or writing official documents. Well, the scholar beauty novels are sort of an answer to that, right? Like, what if that exact thing made you desirable? Uh, you can see why that would be a pretty popular genre, right? Especially if you're, you know, a scholar. If you're a scholar, exactly. Well, you can see why, you know, somewhere like you, Dafu, would read this. And you're right. Like, he's, he's sort of internalized all these. To some extent, the sinking, the story is almost a parody of those. Like, what if you're a scholar beauty, but you're so lame that even in the genre of scholar beauty novels, y you just can't make it work. I, I almost don't. I think the thing that makes this story so weird is that it's not a parody. It should be a parody, but it's not a parody. He's taking himself it's serious. dead serious. Yeah, yeah. dead and, serious. And I think that that goes back to the time that it's being written, you know, 1921. Uh, Japan has not yet penetrated uh, Chinese territory officially, but there is this threat of Western colonialists who are completely in control of 
large portions of of formerly Qing territory. I mean, the Qing Empire has has been out. Uh, it 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 KO'd in about a decade before this story is written. But you know, it it's just a very a time when things are very uh, earnest for China. Geopolitically, China is being threatened. Right, and you know the the solution or not the solution, but I suppose the the diagnosis by people like Lu Xun, Zhou Zoran, Hu Shi, like a lot of the sort of what we call the May Fourth Movement writers, was to look around and go, you know what, maybe the problem was not what they were talking about in Shui Hu Zhuan, that we just don't have enough muscles. Maybe the problem is what's going on in each one of us, our minds, our hearts, our souls, however you want to think of those. So maybe the real problem is people just aren't examining themselves. It's not that they're not going out and getting it done on the battlefield. And so a lot of the stories written in this era are fiercely interior, by which I mean the vast majority of what's happening is happening inside the character's own head, which is definitely this one. He gets rebuffed by one woman and just wanders around for the next three pages wondering what's going on and why, or he's going to sit and contemplate a leaf. That's this sort of very romantic, poetic thing that you just didn't really see before this because either the, the ladies were coming to you like in the scholar beauty novels or you were going out and getting it done like in the other stories we've talked about. This is something different. This is, this is an attempt to diagnose the problem within oneself, which is very different. And I think that's one of the things that, that sinking and Yudafu uniquely contributes to Chinese literature is that within one, that one, within oneself uh, you know, we've never, you can kind of track the the, and I'm going to use some big literary words here. The the development of subjectivity that is like people go from being these two dimensional characters in Shui Hu Zhuan to being sort of three dimensional, almost three dimensional in Jinping Mei, and then we get here, and it's so inside your head that it's almost like. What's going on? We read a, a story. We did a podcast on a story called "The General's Head" uh, several years ago, and that's even that's that's kind of a parody of of the psychological novel. This is like the psychological novel taken to its full psychologicalness. You could see Goethe writing something like this: uh, just these long, lingering sighs of melancholy over one's fate. This and is this is very much the Chinese versions of the sorrows of young Werther. Yeah, but of course that in itself, uh, it, it was you could read even the sorrows of young Werther by Goethe as sort of a a response to a similar thing, right? This we've had this this hyper masculine expression of muscles and force. Uh, so now what do we have, right? So Because we're not that anymore. We're a totally different society. So what does that mean? Just to point out, the Sorrows of Young Werther is also very much concerned with the state of the nation in Germany. And as Germany moves from being a collection of, of small principalities that have share, and share a language to this desire to unite the nation. I don't know. I'm, I'm mm. not an expert on German literature, and I don't know how it No, plays really? Out. I know. Um, although we, we do have Rob, who is an expert on French literature. but, but Expert, she, definitely. Uh, but, you know, it, it, there are lots of parallels here. I, yeah. It, it's, it's weird. Well, none of these things are brand new, right? And it, it, one of the most interesting things to me about uh, a lot of these movements is that they happen in such similar ways. Uh, there's a reason why you can compare something like The Sorrows of Young Werther and this story, because there's something similar happening. They're drawing off of a lot of the same text. Right. That's one of the reasons. Now, in this story, the... If there is a romantic hero in this story, I would say it's Byron. And Byron mm. is mentioned several times. He's very big for the May 4th movement. Yes. He is the guy. And you are you might be like, huh, Byron, that guy from like the 1820s who was big in, in England at that time? Yes, yes. that Byron. And they're, they're drawing off of this notion of romanticism, both German romanticism and English romanticism. And Yudafu... He's very well read in terms of his his non Chinese literatures. He he knows I believe he knows Japanese. He speaks Japanese very well, but he also speaks English very well, and that comes out in the story. There are portions of the story that are entirely in English, and I just want to point something out. We're going to do a podcast eventually on a Taiwanese writer who is talking about some people in the May Fourth Movement. Byron comes up in that story too. Yeah. Uh, for a lot of the other May 4th writers, it's Tolstoy. 
which is a completely different ball of wax entirely. But this is this is why this is this particular story is such an interesting entry into this series because the question in the story is how do we achieve some of the same aims that that motivated the the outlaws in in the water margin or even Xi Minqing, but with com- with a completely different avenue, right? They're not talking about toast whatevs like who cares let's just sit and think all day there's a concern right the nation must be protected we as a people have to be something more uh which is why in the story he's on he's sexually dysfunctional simply because he's chinese right there's there's a lack here but in this case the way to remedy the lack is not muscles or or aphrodisiacs or something else it's solitary reflection i I think that's a great point i would also just point out that in Chui Hu Juan, the, the nature of the relationship between China and the barbarian mm. is quite different. You have these masculine barbarians who are bearing down on China from the north at that point, and we know now that they eventually take over large portions of Chinese territory. At, in, in, when Yudafu was writing, the threat is not from these strong barbarians from the, these physically masculinely strong barbarians from the north, but the threat is from people who have better technology. Hmm. It's not just about kind of exploitation of muscles. It's about the exploitation of brain power, which kind of reflects a different answer that the Shui Juan and Yudafu offer in terms of how to solve China's geopolitical crisis. Right. It, the only thing I would I would say though in in sort of response to that is depending on how much of the May 4th movement you read, the problem isn't even primarily technological, but personal. Uh, This is always Lu Xun's angle is, yes, these other countries have invaded, that's bad. But the thing is, we've been shooting ourselves in the foot for the last several millennia, and we got to do something about that. We have to do something about our own literature, you know, and write something different. And Yudafu is not of exactly the same mindset, but this is an attempt to write a solution to that. So I think that's a great place to wrap it up. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.